Well, hi everyone, Sean Humphreys here. Welcome to All Things Retirement. Well, in this video, we're going to cover off uh, some key elements from the most recent uh, tabling of the federal budget, March 2023. And I had a chance to have a conversation with Eric Sikaski, who's a CPA. We, he works in conjunction with our practice to help uh, deliver to particular business owners, uh, business succession planning and tax planning. So Eric and I are going to talk about those six key areas that he thought would be relevant. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. Now, for some of you, as you re review this video and just listen to it, if you're a business owner and you're beginning to think about your own business succession planning and tax planning, if you go to the show notes for this video, you'll find links back to our website. Don't hesitate to visit our website. Uh, click the connect button so you can start a conversation. We'd be happy to uh, walk you through some of our services in the business succession planning area. Okay, without any further ado, let's uh, listen to the conversation that Eric and, and I had just recently. Well, thanks, Eric, for joining us today for our uh, discussion on uh, budget. The most recent uh, federal budget, so March of 2023, was kind of handed down. And um, I think in our conversation prior to our discussion today, I, th I think you kind of mentioned that it wasn't wasn't a, an earth-shaking budget right it was more uh more just a few housekeeping items but if you want to describe the budget uh this that was just released how would you describe it overall yeah to summarize no big surprises like you said uh in fact it was actually a little tax light um out of the tax measures introduced proposed or updated um you know there are i'd say about six that are certainly worth uh, discussing a little bit more today Perfect. So maybe we can get into some of those those key items. And I like I like tax light, so that kind of sounds good to me. But uh, we can kind of get into uh, that in more detail. So um, I know that one of the topics, and we're going to go through again, like you said, some of the key ones that were part of this budget. But uh, one of the areas that came up was this notion of the auto tax filing program uh, for lower income individuals. Can you? Kind of give us some backstory to that, maybe expand on why you felt that was um, a, a key or one of the key summary points from the budget. Sure. So according to CRA, up to 12% of Canadians do not actually file their tax returns. And the majority of these individuals being low income who would pay little to no tax and could actually be missing out on some valuable benefits and support. Okay. So the file, my, the file My Return program uh, focused on these low and fixed income individuals is being tripled by 2025. So that's what was proposed in the budget. This is not a new program. It's just being expanded. Um, like I said, no significant changes. Um, it allows those on the lower fixed income with simple tax situations that do not change from year to year uh, to file over the phone. So a set of simple questions are asked and using the data that CRA would have on file. So think T4, T4 e slips, things like that. The yeah. return can be the return can be assessed. Um, so, just to give you some context on the numbers, the budget 2023 is proposing to increase the number of eligible Canadians for this program uh, to two million by 2025. Okay, okay. So it's not insignificant then. So, I think anytime they can um, have a you know a, a change administratively, it just makes it easier for people to file. And particularly, like you said, they may not be taking advantage of um, certain breaks that uh, they might be eligible for. So that sounds like a great thing, actually. Yeah, it's not always easy to uh, to file your tax return, especially for the low-income individuals. Either they, either they don't have access to a computer or yeah. they just don't, yeah. um, you know, it, this just makes it a lot easier in a, you know, 10, 15 minute phone call to get it done. Oh, perfect. Now, as I scan the, the budget as well, there was um, some discussion on um, both RESP, so Registered Educational Savings Plans, and RDSP, so Registered Disability Savings Plans. So again, it sounds like there were a little bit more tweaks, but maybe you can expand on what was taking place with that particular area of the budget. Sure. So let me start with RESPs. Um, and just a bit of a background, government grants uh, provided in these plans and the investment income uh, earned on that can be withdrawn by eligible beneficiaries as an education assistance payment or EAP, I'll refer to them as, okay. um, assuming assuming they're enrolled in an eligible post-secondary program. So these withdrawals are taxable. Uh, currently, there are specific limits on the amount of EAPs that can be withdrawn. So for students enrolled full-time up to this point, uh, the limit's been $5,000 for, yeah. for the first 13 consecutive weeks of enrollment within a 12-month period. And for beneficiaries enrolled part-time, that limits $2,500 per 
13 week period. So budget 2023 proposed to increase the amount of EAP withdrawals up to 8,000 for the first 13 consecutive weeks for full-time students and $4,000 for part-time students. Um, these changes would come into effect as of the budget day 2023. So the impact here is now, if a student reaches the end of their education and still contained within their plan are some government grants, those may need to be returned back to the government. So we want to use those up as much as possible. So increasing yeah. the amount of EAP withdrawals will will aid in that happening and, and avoid having to pay that back. No, that's that's excellent. I mean, I always thought that that, that amount of $5,000 was on the low end anyway. Um, it seemed to be an odd kind of uh, regulatory sort of administrative guidance on what could be done. So it's good that they've lifted that and increased it. So uh, I think it's probably a welcome news for a lot of families as their kids are heading off to uh, to university or post-secondary. Absolutely. Um, also, the up to this point, um, just another, another RESP change, uh, only spouses or common law partners can jointly enter into an agreement with an RESP promoter to open an RESP and be the subscribers of the plan. Um, this recent budget proposed to enable divorced or separated parents to open a joint RESP for one or more of the children, which just makes sense. Yeah. There are lifetime contribution maximums that are imposed on uh, on the beneficiaries of these types of plans. And if we have two sets of parents both contributing for one child in separate plans, uh, you can lose track of the money going in and the money going out. So this will just make things a lot easier for those families. Absolutely. That's a, that, so, so those are the kind of initiatives that just make practical yep. Practical sense. Well, that's perfect. Now, is that now any other items on the RESP or did you want to go to the RDSP now? Um, we can move to the RDSP. Uh, small change. In fact, it's not really a change. It's almost an extension of, um, of a pre-existing measure that was set to expire. Um, but all the budget done, okay. all the budget did was extend measures to allow family members, uh, including siblings now, to open an RDSP account for an individual uh, who may not have a legal representative. So it just makes okay. it easier for, for families to look after um, their their loved ones in setting up these plans. Perfect. Yeah. So so although it wasn't, they're not significant changes. It sounds like they're just great administrative common sense changes. So that's that's excellent. Um, let's now talk about the dreaded, I'll call it the dreaded, but the alternative minimum tax, uh, apparently was tweaked or changed in mm -hmm. this budget. So you can maybe give us some background on what we often refer to as AMT. How has that been impacted by this most recent budget? Sure. So alternative minimum tax, uh, it doesn't impact a large majority of Canadian taxpayers Yeah, and yeah. it can be co a complicated calculation. So without overcomplicating things, uh, it's basically a tax calculation alongside our standard tax calculation that allows fewer deductions, exemptions, and tax credits than the normal tax rules. So a taxpayer would either pay AMT or regular tax, whichever is higher. So in some cases, a high-income individual may take advantage of various deductions, tax credits, or tax-efficient income to obtain a very low tax rate under our right. standard tax calculations. So if AMT is calculated higher than the standard tax, they'll pay the AMT tax rate. So what Budget 2023 proposed is a change in its calculation to attempt to better target the higher income individuals. So there's a number of key changes um, that get very complicated, <clears throat> but the main mm -hmm. changes are raising the AMT standard exemption from 40,000 to approximately 173. So this will this will eliminate some of the lower income individuals from being subject to AMT. And secondly, the actual AMT rate would increase from its current amount of 15% up to 20 and a half percent. So okay. these rules are set to come into effect in 2024. And the whole idea is we want to target more of the high income earners and hit them harder. That's, that's the idea behind them. Uh, it's difficult to say what exactly would will be the impact of these changes. Um, yeah. And if it, it'll actually work in, in targeting the high income individuals as intended, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. No, exactly. It's uh, the proof is in the pudding always with these changes. Uh, government has one sort of intended direction they want to pursue, but in reality, um, you know, effective tax planning and then how people react to it will be the real test as to what happens as a result of these changes. Exactly. Um, now you mentioned uh, before we um, had set up this appointment, we talked a little bit about succession planning for business owners and specifically um, Bill C-208. And um, 
And I think this is when we one that we'll want to impact, unpack a little bit. Um, maybe mm-hmm. you can give us a backstory to Bill C-208 and, um, and its impact in terms of business planning. Sure. So first off, these changes or updates uh, in budget 2023 were 100% expected. In fact, we've been waiting on these for more than a year now. We've right. <laughs> um, the, the previous legislation that came in was you know effectively incomplete. Uh, so this is the uh, their attempt at completing it. So okay. as some context, back in 2021, Bill C-28 was introduced uh, to help in transferring a family business to the next generation. Okay. Prior yeah. to 2021, Selling your business to an unrelated third party would inadvertently yield a far better tax result than selling the same business for the same amount to your children. So that doesn't make any sense. The capital gain in that case would otherwise that would otherwise result from selling to your kids may be recharacterized as a dividend, which are subject to higher tax rates. So Bill C-28 was implemented to level the playing field, so to speak, uh, to avoid this recharacterization and also allow parents to claim the capital gains exemption um, if the shares qualify. So this could either significantly reduce or eliminate any tax owing on the sale. So, well, and, and there's all, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but there's oh, all right. kinds of businesses or industries where this would have been uh, impacting, right? So, so mm-hmm. would the ag sector or what sectors would have been keenly feeling these uh, these issues, you know, any, any small business, the egg sector, your mom and pop shops, your yeah. manufacturing companies from, you know, with a couple hundred thousand dollars of revenue to million dollars of revenue, you know, it impacts any business that's looking to transition from, you know, mom and dad to the kids, uh, while using, um, while, while obtaining, you know, some preferential tax rates. So, so that's excellent. Yeah. Since, since the bill was originally introduced back in 2021, um, the legislation was somewhat rushed, I would say. And, okay. you know, according to CRA, adequate safeguards were not put in place. So it was designed to facilitate a true intergenerational transfer. Yet uh, the legislation allowed parents to utilize these new rules and receive preferential tax treatment, you know, capital gains instead of dividends, yeah. or using capital gains exemption without actually transferring control of the business to their children. Oh, okay. So we, we get all these. Have your cake and eat it too. It sounds awesome. <laughs> exactly. So budget 2023 proposed uh, to ensure the rules in bill C-28 only apply where a true genuine intergenerational transfer takes place. Okay. So without going into all the specifics, um, the changes proposed also outline two main transfer options in respect of transferring control of the business. Uh, number one is an immediate business transfer. This is what they call now the three-year test. And number two is a gradual business transfer, the five to 10 year test. So there's, there's two options to, to, um, to undergo this, <clears throat> this succession plan. It's either the immediate test, again, everything's got to be done within three years or gradual where you can do it over a five to 10 year period. And there's certain, um, certain key measures that you need to meet along the way. Um, however, each condition, so each, each option uh, will require the transfer of actual control to the child. Okay. The yeah. transfer of economic interest, so your common growth shares, um, employment of the child. The, the child actually has to work in the business, and the business right. has to be an active business. So we can't have mom and dad who who have an active business. They sell the business, and all of a sudden, all the assets are sold and just turn it into an investment business. That would be offside for these rules. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, long list of things to uh, to look at. Um, always recommend you know. Talking to your accountants anytime you're you're proposing something like this because there's there's certain uh, criteria that need to be met to uh, to fall into these rules. Yeah, that's a really great overview. Now, I think anyone watching the video can probably get a sense that this this is something that Eric really knows well. And in fact, if you're watching the video and you're a business owner and you're beginning to think about a succession planning for your business, uh, in the show notes for this video will be a link back to our website where we talk about our business succession planning services and how you can tap into expertise from individuals like Eric on these topics. So it's uh, really good. So I guess a lot of this succession planning for the kids is not going to happen at 25. Now that full control has to be given, it's going to happen at 65, right? <laughs> so yeah. anyway, exactly. so that's that's a practical, probably expected uh, change, like you said, and kind of uh, clears things up and and deals with some of the anomalies in the tax code that people were exploiting. Mm-hmm. Um, now, there's another area kind of somewhat related. So we had talked about uh, succession planning for businesses. But I know that when we were talking before, you mentioned uh, employee ownership trusts. Um, 
So again, for a lot of our viewers, they may not be familiar with it, but it could be relevant for some people watching this video. So maybe you can expand upon that topic as well, Eric. Sure. So employee ownership trusts or EOTs, I'll refer to them as, um, this is a relatively new concept. In fact, it was originally introduced back in 2021 and, and last year's budget actually had some, some good information on employee ownership trusts. Um, so selling, to, we're, we're talking about some succession planning items here. So selling to your children is one succession plan for many business owners. Yeah. But in some instances where we're dealing with a business that has, has long-term employees and maybe kids that don't want to be involved, selling to the employees might make a lot of sense for the future of the business. So yeah. an employee ownership trust is a form of employee ownership where a trust holds shares of a corporation for the corporation's employees. Okay. These trusts, uh, they facilitate the purchase of a business without the employees themselves having to obtain third-party financing to pay for the shares directly, okay. which, which can often be often be difficult. So yeah, for sure. the trusts themselves can borrow money as a separate entity um, to purchase the shares from the owner. I mean, the, the key difference here is the trust is the one who's going to own these shares, not the employees directly. Yeah. Um, but it does allow the employees to have a stake in the business and, and be able to afford this purchase. So you know, what, but, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Um, so I was just going to say, so, but for budget 2023, um, it expands on what was in 2022 with a few key changes to these EOTs. Um, the budget proposed to allow a 10 year capital gain reserve on the sale of shares. So this is for okay. the exiting business owner. We could spread that gain out over a longer period of time um, just to ease the tax burden on them. Secondly, and very importantly, is if the trust borrows money from the corporation itself as a shareholder loan to make payments for this purchase, normally following the shareholder loan rules, it would be required to be repaid within one year to avoid adverse tax consequences. However, this doesn't really make sense for, it, it would it would be very difficult to, to uh, fund the purchase and have to repay within a year. So exactly. the budget yeah. the budget proposed an increase to repayment time to 15 years. So this frees up the ability for the EOT to use corporate funds to pay down the loan over time. Well, another, finally, another, another yeah. example of just practical legislation. I mean, that, yeah. that that's that's fantastic. Absolutely. And the final, um, final key change here is an employee ownership trust uh, would be exempt from the 21-year rule. So currently, most trusts are deemed to dispose of their assets every 21 years. Uh, okay. But this rule would create a significant tax liability for these EOTs. Yeah. Uh, so the budget proposed to exempt uh, them from the 21-year 21 21-year rule as they're designed to be in place long-term and for the benefit of the employees. So still, yeah. still plenty of information coming out, um, but they do present a, a great option for succession planning. Yeah, you know, you think of the last two points we talked about, the employee ownership trusts and then succession planning for business owners who clarification on Bill C-208. I mean, I think it recognizes, I think, you know, fortunately, the, you know, the federal government recognizes that we're going through a massive generational transfer right now in in businesses, small business, medium-sized businesses right across the country. That would be the case, correct? Is that you've been in your experience? A lot of activity, a lot of people planning these transitions, given that baby boomers are aging and and retiring is that, is that 100% yeah. that is that is absolutely a focus of uh, of the department of finance when they look at um, implementing some of these rules is they know this is yeah. coming so let's make it as as you know streamlined and, and simple as possible for uh, for this succession planning yeah perfect okay now sometimes referred to as gar the general anti avoidance rules um were i guess expanded but maybe you can talk about Gar, for those of you uh, that are watching this video, you may not be familiar with the term. Um, and Eric, maybe you can kind of just give us some backstory to that, and then just share with with uh, us sort of what uh, what the changes were or the expanded um, notion of Gar in this legislation or this budget. Sure. So Gar, it, the general anti avoidance rules, is is nothing new. Yeah. It was originally put in place as a catch all to try and prevent abusive tax planning. So. Current legislation can't contemplate every possible tax transaction that might take place. So GAR was established as a fallback legislation to punish abuse or misuse of the tax rules that aren't covered anywhere else. Okay. If, uh, if GAR applies to a transaction, it looks to deny the tax benefit that is created. So 
Two main changes to GAR that Budget 2023 proposed um, are number one is changing the avoidance transaction standard to a one of the main purposes test. So this is a big one because in the past, as long as the main purpose of the transaction was deemed for some business purpose, and that taxpayer just happened to also receive this tax benefit, mm. you know, GAR shouldn't apply. This new change suggests that as long as obtaining this beneficial tax treatment is one of the main purposes. So even in, in addition to a business purpose, GAR may still apply. So oh, we don't really? necessarily know how this purpose test is going to be applied, um, but it's something we will have to continue to monitor. It's interesting to say the least. So GAR is one of those things, and I may not be correct in my description or characterization of this, but GAR is sort of like you can do your very best. And I mean, as a CPA or an accountant, you can put these structures in place, recommendations for clients, you understand the tax code, you know how things are going to be structured appropriately um, so that you don't get your clients in trouble. But ultimately, GAR is kind of this thing that kind of hovers in the background, right? That could impact some of the planning that, that professionals put in place for their clients. It, it, would that be a correct assessment? It's always kind of lurking there. Um, how would you characterize it in the grand scheme of tax planning? I would characterize it exactly as you have. So, if no, normally, if if we're if um, if uh, if the tax world is undertaking some sort of tax transaction, um, and it's within the 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 legislation that currently exists, yeah. but we know CRA doesn't like it, oh, okay. that's when we get worried that GAR might apply because oh, ultimately, okay. what it's trying to do is stop the abuse of or misuse of tax legislation. Yeah. Uh, so we need re there's certain transactions out there that you know while they fall within the rules we need to be really careful that there's actually a business purpose to doing it. Um, otherwise you might get caught up here. I, I think that's a really good um, basic principle anyway. I mean it's interesting in our channel um, where we put our content we try to be very appropriate um, you know strategies and principles that are um, in line with you know what can be done as best as we know, and yet you sometimes see content out there that seems really really aggressive, and um, and I suspect that probably these same strategies often will get caught up and gar where all of a sudden the CRA is attacking these strategies or ideas because it just falls outside of what they would deem to be um, sort of the the notion of what the tax code is trying to achieve. So. Um, hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, there's um, a, there's actually a, a second, um, the second main change that they did want to impose was a new 25% penalty was also proposed. Oh, really? So this would this would be in addition to the pre-existing rule that denied whatever tax benefit was received. So this looks at preventing those taxpayers who take the risk, knowing that you know if I get caught under GAR, yeah. then I'll just be put back into the same position as if I didn't undertake this particular transaction, but just did it the you know the safe way, so now there's also okay. a penalty that can apply, which is to you know disincentivize these particular taxpayers. Um, but funny enough, uh, the finance also did comment that the penalty can be avoided if the transaction's disclosed to CRA. So if you disclose your transaction, what you're doing to CRA, and they find that guard does apply, the penalty can be avoided if if you were upfront about what you were doing. So I found that I found that interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, that's why you, you pay for professional advice and um, you try to be, you know, doing things within the box as best as possible. And I think that a lot of times um, people get in trouble because uh, they're coloring way outside the lines. And that's when some of these uh, pieces can kind of kick in. So GAR is definitely something to be aware of in your tax planning. Absolutely. And Sean, you know, one thing that I wanted to mention um you know, all the tax measures that were proposed, there's nothing surprising in there, but yeah. perhaps one of the more interesting items um, that I thought was a change we didn't end up seeing, uh, the capital gains inclusion rate of 50% has been rumored to be increasing for, you know, five, the past five years or so. Exa um, exactly. And I'm, gra I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. So I'd love yeah. to hear your comments on that. The the last few budgets were obviously dominated with COVID-related credits and programs. So, you know, it wasn't completely surprising to not see an increase in, in those. But, yeah. you know, given that we're coming out on the other side of the pandemic here, um, you know, it was certainly a real possibility with this budget. Um, so it was nice to see an increase was not included. But, you know, this will be top of mind for for all of us moving forward as uh, as you know, future budgets get released.
No, exactly. And the feds are always going to be looking for yeah. extra sources of revenue. So it's an easy way um, to do it. That's for sure. You know, exactly. Well, this has been really helpful, Eric. I mean, I mean, what's encouraging about some of these areas you've touched upon is that there's been some common sense rules or guidance on some of these uh, topic areas, which is which is great to hear. Um, I really like um, the the two topic areas we talked about, whether it's Bill C two hundred eight or employee ownership trust, where there's a recognition, this massive generational transfer of business owners trying to monetize the value of their businesses. Um, whether it's to family members or to employees, uh, those are encouraging things. And and like I said, uh, for those of you watching this video, uh, if you're a business owner and you're looking for advice on business succession planning, then again, go to the show notes. There's a link back to our website so you can get more information on, on that. Eric, thanks again so much for making time for us today. I'm looking forward to our next discussion. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, our Appreciate pleasure. It. You take Yeah, you take care. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Well, that concludes the interview with Eric. I think he did a great job summarizing some of the key takeaways from this year's budget. Again, if you go back to the show notes for this video, you can find links back to our website where you can find out more information about the business corporate succession planning that we get involved in. Eric does some wonderful consulting in that area. As well in the show notes are links back to free resources for overall retirement income planning. And if you want to get a retirement forecast that's free, then again, in our website, you can find out how you can get that. Anyway, I'm wishing you all the best in your retirement and overall wealth planning journey. You take care. Bye-bye.